introduce ourselves. I'm going to suggest that we just take the hour we have and whoever is ready to speak, speak. Um, raise your hand if you'd like to speak so that all of us know that. And um, whenever you're ready to speak and somebody else is speaking, it's okay to raise your hand. But we'll just start. And um, we have an hour, maybe a little bit longer if we really want that. And um, James will disappear and have a timer very visible for us to see it. And when we start speaking, he'll flip the, he'll have it run the timer for two minutes, flip it over and then run it for two minutes and then flip it over. And if we talk for six minutes, then we can all moan or whatever. Um, <laughs> but probably won't talk that long. Okay, ready to go? So welcome, I'm delighted to see you. It's November 25th, happy Thanksgiving to you all. And I will attempt to be quiet and let the first person who'd like to say something, say something. My name is Nancy Tuckman. I'm at Loyola University, Chicago, and um, I'm the Dean of a new school of environmental sustainability. <laughs> Uh, my area of research is um, restoration of Great Lakes wetlands, coastal wetland ecosystems. And, but, Nancy, and why don't you continue? Um, well, I'll just say that it's a pleasure to be here with all these people. And I've seen you in, in uh, various venues and also read work that you have done. And I know that we're all sort of of a like mind, um, that we're very concerned about the urgent and vexing problems of uh, climate change and environmental sustainability. Um, I really love the work that those of you that are in business schools are doing, um, because I, I do have a sense that in um, our business schools in the United States, when we teach the mainstream economics and mainstream finance and mainstream business management, all we're doing is um, imparting the, the methods that got us into this problem in the first place. And it really bothers me when Jesuit universities teach that stuff. Um, I belong to a Jesuit university that does teach that stuff. And I know that a lot of our students in our business schools come from China to learn how to be a rich American and, and you know, make a lot of money and um, run your business with the bottom line as the, the main goal. And so, um, you know, the work that many of you are doing is really inspiring to me. And um, as an ecologist, I really appreciate that. It's, uh, it's a lot of risk, I know, to make your um, business schools much more about a regenerative business, a regenerative economy. So um, thank you for that. Okay, now you have to flip that timer because I don't want that to run out on my time. <laughs> I'm going to save the rest of it for you for later. <laughs> oh, Jan? My name is Jan Dash. Um, I'm the editor of the World Scientific uh, Climate Change Encyclopedia. That's what I'm doing now. Um, in my, my background is I was a physics professor for a long time and totally in academia. And then I was uh, on, on the street as a risk manager and quant finance guy for 30 years. Um, and I've been doing climate change work on the side now for the last 15 years. And uh, since we brought up the subject of business, uh, I, I believe business is the key actually to, to moving the needle on climate change. Uh, governments should provide policy and some money. Uh, and then uh, uh, in terms of the actual implementation of a uh, number of trillions of dollars that's necessary to move into a, re a renewable economy to uh, uh, slow down at least the uh, destructive impacts of climate change. Uh, uh, business will have to do that because they're the only ones that have those capital resources. Government doesn't have the money to do that uh, in the same, at the same scale. So, uh, and one of the things that I've always felt that uh, businesses uh, are going to need is are people that report directly to the C-suite uh, that understand climate <clears throat> risk management. That is to say, they understand something about climate change, 
they understand risk management, and they understand a number of specialized topics. And I think that uh, that demand is going to be enhanced with the uh, TCFD and all of the uh, guideline uh, disclosure uh, recommendations that I think are soon going to turn out to be uh, requirements and not recommendations. Uh, and I think that, uh, biz that universities could have profitably start master's degrees programs uh, in this area where they teach number one, something about risk management, number two, something about climate change, and number three, specialized topics to create what I call climate change risk and opportunity officers. Hmm. So I see my minute is up. <laughs> you got five more minutes to go and open in the next hour. Next. Michael, and then John. I just saw Michael's hand first. My name is Michael Pearson. I'm a professor uh, at Fordham University. I concur with what most of you have said. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, very interesting format, uh, interested in, in exploring this. And I, um, I don't know, I, I, my work specifically centers on rethinking the core foundations, the intellectual building blocks of the dominant paradigm that I call economistic. And uh, that has to do with the question of where we think we come from, uh, who we are and where we're going. And uh, I call this approach to organizing humanistic management and it centers on the protection of dignity and the promotion of well-being or flourishing as John uh, calls it. And it's a sort of combination or consilience of the various knowledge streams that we have been using at universities, the social, the humanities, the social and the natural sciences. I leave it at that, I thank you. Thank you, John. Ah, I think you're muted. You are, you are right. Thank right. you, John. I'm uh, John. Ehrenfeld. Um, I've been at this business probably longer than anybody here. Uh, my interest in the environment goes back to the 60s. Um, in the 60s, I, I started one of the very first companies in the US to begin to do work research in the environmental field. And I bopped around uh, in this area ever since. Um, after bouncing around quite a bit with a little bit of time in, in public service, I ended up back at my alma mater, MIT, uh, where I spent about 18 years. Um, I think the program that I, I started and ran at MIT called Technology, Business, and the Environment was, was maybe the first, certainly one of the first uh, couple of academic programs to begin to look at the issue of business and the environment. Um, a lot of PhDs, a lot of fun, a lot of uh, interest in this area. Um, was there when sustainability came on the scene and, and helped the university get going in, in that area. I retired in 2000 and ever since then I've been writing about sustainability, but I take a different view as Michael Pearson said. I look at sustainability in terms of the ability to uh, produce uh, flourishing, not only human, but other uh, species. Um, I don't know that business is, I think business will play a great role in this, but I'm not sure that business is the, the, the key player. Um, there's an awful lot of mind changing that has to go on if, if, if they are to become this. Um, anyway, I've written a number of books uh, on the subject and um, I look forward to a continued conversation with everybody here today and in the future. David? There we go. Uh, thank you, Jim. <clears throat> um, well, my name is David Gauci and I'm on the faculty at the Gabelli School of Business at Fordham University. And after, oh gosh, nine years of being a dean 
at uh, one place or another, I finally grabbed my brain back and uh, got back into something intellectual and things that in inspire me uh, much more, which uh, my focus is related uh, to everything you've talked about, but it's really quite um, directly on energy and where energy fits in really society. But I have pushed this initiative uh, called Innovation in Business and Energy. Uh, subscribing, I think, probably very much to what Jan uh, presented, that I think uh, business should be viewed as being um, an instrument for change. And uh, there are probably ways to change um, um, the paradigm uh, that businesses can sort of wrestle with, I, I think, contemporary problems that relate, obviously, to climate change, but through e energy choices and the use of energy systems, but also to respect and understand uh, kind of um, the inertia or the momentum and the difficulty of supplanting infrastructures that have been put in place uh, more than a hundred years ago and uh, what the economic consequences are of making the adjustments. Um, but all the while to try to inspire change. Um, there is an article that I, I found actually kind of interesting uh, that is con relatively consistent with what I think Jan just argued and what I would argue that appeared in Foreign Affairs in May of 2020 uh, by uh, uh, Nancy Henderson, who's, uh, who's at MIT, <laughs> um, uh, who argues the same thing. So it, it, it encourages me that there are more and more people who are beginning to sort of tackle this this, this huge problem, uh, recognizing that it's, it's really a priority of the moment and uh, it's going to continue for the foreseeable future. So thank you, Jim, for inviting me. And I love the opportunity to, to listen to everybody else here. Thank you. Thank you, David. I guess I'm going to be a little bit more active facilitator than I thought. Um, I'm waiting for Hunter to raise her hand. There it is, Hunter. Sorry, trying to get a dozen things done. Um, <laughs> my day job is that I run an NGO called Natural Capitalism Solutions. We work with companies, communities, countries, helping them implement more regenerative practices profitably. I'm a professor at the Bard MBA in sustainable management in which sustainability is baked into every class we teach. And I teach, I don't know, depending on the year, half a dozen classes there. Michael Pearson and Jim uh, dragooned me into teaching at Fordham. So I periodically teach there. I may also become the new dean of a new program. I have dogs. Uh, new program at uh, Sierra Nevada University, in, which would be an undergraduate program in sustainability, so watch this space. I'm also one of the founders of a uh, finance company called Change Finance. We built the first truly fossil fuel free exchange traded fund, which has uh, since then been outperforming. Um, I'm now currently running a thing called the Colorado Regenerative Recovery Coalition. This is a coalition of uh, Businesses, scientists, uh, local government officials, NGOs, citizens across Colorado to build a regenerative recovery here. We are, as you may have noticed, in a pandemic. The economy will recover, but to what? The old economy didn't work for a lot of people. We want to build a regenerative recovery and a regenerative economy. I write books, my latest uh, book called A Finer Future, Creating an Economy in Service to Life. That's one of about, I don't know, 16 that I actually wrote about 30 odd that I had a hand in. Um, I'm a partner in a thing called Now Partners, which is an international consulting organization that's just being formed called The Board You Can't Afford. And we work with very large companies full member of the Club of Rome with Michael Pearson on the board of a battery company called Simplify Power. We uh, deliver 
lithium ion ferrous phosphate batteries into areas of the world that need uh, standalone power. Also with Michael helped create a thing called Leading for Wellbeing. We, uh, that subsequently morphed into a thing called the Wellbeing Economy Alliance, uh, which Michael and I and some others helped create. I've now walked away from that because I think it's just become a talk fest. Uh, worked on climate for uh, a, a lot of years. Uh, this pin on my hat is the pin from the Kyoto Protocol, uh, organizing now to go to Glasgow. So not entirely idle. Thank you. I'm sending messages to um, James to make sure the egg timer gets flipped over. It, it, <laughs> Thank you. It did. It did. Jack, Jack, I know you haven't raised your hand, but wanted, since everybody else has spoken, I think now. OK, yeah. So my name is Jack Epker. I'm currently a junior at Fordham University's Gabelli School of Business. I'm a finance major and sustainable business minor. Um, I've Oddly enough, I've taken Professor Pearson's course currently, uh, Sustainable Business, and I got introduced to the subject of sustainable business about a year ago, uh, taking Professor uh, Stoner's management course. From there, I worked as his teaching assistant for an entire semester, working on just uh, my input on working how do we can make the curriculum more sustainable, uh, get business students more interested in sustainable business, not just aware of sustainable business. And we've work, been working uh, together ever since. Um, through the summer, I worked with uh, James Weishert as well with Global Movement. We're a sustainable business education organization uh, started by Professor Stoner and James Weishert. Uh, I do a lot of their marketing. I've done graphic design for them. I've done so worked on social media for them, helped with the website. Um, and I've also worked in the sustainable consulting space. I'm very interested in working in the sustainability space in terms of like getting internships, working with sustainable supply chains, and overall just try to get students more interested and not only more aware, but more actively involved in making uh, business a more sustainable area. Thank you. Now, I don't know how we should go next. Um, I No, I have a couple of questions and an observation and everything. Um, I'd like to see some hands real soon so we have things to choose from. One thing that um, comes up for me is I know Nancy, for example, has an exciting sent, uh, event coming up and I think a bunch of you all have some exciting things coming up. I know Michael's International Humanistic Management Association has some exciting things coming up. And the timer should be running for me also, um, even though I'm quote the facilitator. Uh, but I, And also I have a lot of thoughts like, um, I, I am delighted that the business roundtable has finally said there's some purpose in, for business beyond simply maximizing profit. I, I, I've come to believe that um, we, need, we need to create a lot of new businesses that explicitly are not maximizing profits, but they're simply keeping using profits to stay in existence so they can contribute to well-being. Um, I'm hopeful that some businesses can change, but as long as corporate, as presidents of companies, CEOs have to deal with their stock being in play at all times, I think it puts a real restriction on what they can do in terms of um, really committing to a sustainable world. And so, but uh, I'd like to hear what anybody has to say about anything and I'll try and be quiet for a while. Hunter, you wanna talk about the B Corp? No, but that's an answer to uh, what you were, the problem you were posing. Nancy. Okay, I was gonna go to my blue hand because I'm not sure where you're looking. Um, I'm curious because um, it's really exciting to be in this group with all of you that are working from different perspectives on the same problem, you know, through uh, the business sector. I would love to know where you think we are, maybe on a scale of, you know, one to 10 in terms of turning this um, culture of, you know, the bottom line driven businesses, turning that towards a, more of a common good triple bottom line 
um, that can help us with so many of our cultural, social, and certainly environmental issues. Hunter may have it. John? Well, I began, as I said, a long time ago, 30 years ago, looking at business as the primary agent of change towards sustainability. As, as some, some of you mentioned, it's still a very powerful uh, engine of change, but it's literally uh, 30 years since I really started looking at this field. And as far as I'm concerned, uh, nothing has happened. If anything, uh, we've been going backwards. There's a lot out there. There are all the SG, uh, the, the Millennium Goals, the SDGs, uh, B Corps. Uh, I mean, Hunter can rat, rattle off uh, a longer list than I can because I haven't really stayed in the business and environment area. Um, I don't think it's, it's going to change without some, you know, uh, you know I'd say a, a, a huge uh, force to make a change. Um, my, my whole uh, focus has shifted from looking at, at uh, the, the institutions as they are to trying to dig under the, the very complexities of the world to find out why, why the hell we're still in this problem, how we got here in the first place. Um, and I don't think that a conversation about business uh, without trying to dig pretty deep is going to be very helpful. I learned something from uh, business. Uh, I learned a, a lot about uh, uh, quality management, uh, looking at solving problems. And I take with me a lesson from the Toyota production system that you ask five whys. And when you start asking five whys and you begin to get to the fourth, third, fourth, or fifth, you're starting to, to see that you got to dig into this culture and understand uh, basically the way that the Western culture has evolved for three, 400 years and before you can begin to really, I think, begin to, to see where this problem comes from and where to go with it. Um, when, when I heard Nancy's question and John's comments, it occurred to me that Michael has been very active in an initiative, I think, aimed directly at this problem. Um, Michael, you want to say something about the new narrative adventure? Well, <clears throat> so Hunter was mentioning the, the project uh, that she has been on, uh, that we've co-created with Leading for Wellbeing and, and the Wellbeing Economy Alliance. And I think there are many, many other people in that space you could call it the new paradigm, the rethinking the foundations of civilization. That's something that the Club of Rome is involved in and in, in other groups. And so there are a number of initiatives that are, I think, unpacking what John is sort of saying. What are the, the cultural building blocks, the cultural memes that we have endorsed, that we have difficulty getting rid of, that may trap us in, in the same old sort of addictive uh, behavior? Uh, that we know is not good for us <laughs> and and we still keep doing the same thing over and over and um, one initiative that has emerged since is that we're connecting with some of the narratives that have been ha that had staying power that I, uh, Taleb I think uh, calls anti-fragile they're around for some reason and they are the spiritual narratives they are the the, the religious narratives they are these cultural narratives about who we are where we come from <laughs> and where we're going. And uh, there are a number of places where I think these, these kind of traditions, ancient wisdom traditions meet the most modern scientific evidence of who we are as human beings, the emergence of the cosmos, us of, as, as part of a bigger quantum kind of <laughs> uh, cosmic existence and, and where and how we can potentially rethink uh, those basic existential questions and, and give different answers. And the current answers has been very materialistic, very individualistic, very much, uh, yeah, uh, as a, an idea of separation. Uh, and I think if we can build onto more of a consilience 
in a way that we are seeing ourselves as part of nature as part of society uh, and not separate. I think that that can be part of a, a new way how we can get cultural uh, evolution going in support of, of the bigger picture that we need to address. We are focused, and maybe Jim, that's what you mentioned, to implement that in business education specifically, because I think that's where much of the quote unquote cancer comes from. Uh, and, and much of that um, quote unquote scientific model is 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 perpetuated without much insight and without much reflection and so that's that's the project that that i'm committing to right now and nancy we've been touching base around that and, and others here as well so uh, i'll stop here Maybe I'll add uh, in terms of that, we're working with the Vatican and the, the, the Laudato Si, uh, the integral human development approach. So that's where the anti-fragile resilience of some of the ancient wisdom can come in and potentially guide us towards a more integral flourishing option mm -hmm. for, for life and humans. You're muted, Jim, but I think you called on Jan. Jan, yeah, thank you. Uh, so that's extremely interesting what uh, what, you're, what you said, uh, Michael. So I, I actually believe that a solution to the climate crisis will take place. I believe it will take place. I'm optimistic that it will take place. I have no other choice than to be optimistic that it will take place. It doesn't matter how I feel, I just, uh, you know, Optimism is something that's required. Optimism, courage, and persistence. Those are the three words that I use that I close all my talks with. Uh, and I believe that the solution will take place over a number of dimensions. One dimension is the dimension I think we're talking about now, which is that there's no silver bullet. There's no one solution. We need to have action at all levels and among all types of groups that, uh, 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 since we're talking about all types of groups that uh, include business, I think is a primary key, but that's not enough. It also includes all NGOs, faith-based organizations. It includes civil society in all its dimensions uh, in, and universities. Uh, and it also includes governments at all levels, uh, local, state, national, and international agreements. Uh, it includes people uh, in, acting individually and, and at all those levels. Uh, and I think that that's what we need because uh, this is such a pervasive problem. It touches everything through the, for example, the sustainable development goals. Uh, people say that there will be no solution, long-term solution to any of the goals without a solution to climate change. So number goal number one is poverty and so forth. So uh, climate change is something that is absolutely essential uh, absolutely essential to solve. I do believe that as far as business goes, that there are kind of two aspects. It's, it's, a, it's, there are different kinds of businesses. They're not all the same, number one. Some of them are moving faster than others. And there are two things that I think will really help. First of all, there's the, the impacts that will impact business it may come to the point where, uh, you know, uh, financial and economic systems that are unstable anyway, in unstable equilibrium anyway, will be destabilized uh, if we continue along the present path. That's number one. So impacts of climate change and the opportunities that businesses will have by moving into the 21st century in an enthusiastic way. So, uh, uh, I, I think it's a, you know, it's a complex problem. We have to get moving. We're actually acting now. We need to enhance our actions. Uh, and uh, I think with, uh, you know, change in administration at the federal level, that will actually uh, help a lot. Before we go back to John, who raised his hand a moment ago, I have to observe that Hunter also talks about no silver bullet, but lots of silver buckshot, if I remember. Is that right, Hunter? Yeah. yeah John, that we know how to solve the climate crisis. We know how to do it at a profit. As a result, it is being solved. I highly suggest that you all read the new paper from Tony Seba, S-E-B-A, titled Rethinking Humanity, in which Tony says, in this decade, 
the economy is facing fundamental disruption in five core sectors, energy, transport, food, communications slash IT and materials. Wherever throughout history you have had a tenfold drop in the cost of doing one of those core sectors of the economy, you've had a massive economic dislocation. He says, we're in the next decade, we're going to have these kinds of tenfold drops in all of these sectors. As a result, uh, we are either going to enter a new dark age or a, an unprecedented time of freedom and prosperity. We, since 2014, renewable energy has been becoming cheaper and cheaper and cheaper. Renewables plus batteries now are cheaper everywhere on earth than fossil. This is becoming known to the big oil companies. So uh, Shell just wrote down, what was it? 30 billion BP, 20 billion. No, Exxon 30 billion, Shell 20, BP 20. And this is only going to continue. Carbon Tracker says the about to be stranded assets are 25 trillion stranded fossil assets. At the same time, regenerative agriculture is coming on very rapidly. We know how to take carbon out of the air, put it back in the soil using regenerative agriculture. If we did this on the world's grasslands over 30 years time, we would get back to 280 parts per million concentration of CO2 in the atmosphere. That's the pre-industrial level. And this is happening. We need, I think, to talk in different languages for different groups. So John, you want to talk about uh, transformation in consciousness, knock yourself out. For businesses, Nancy, I would talk not about a triple bottom line. They're not going to keep three sets of books, but what we call an integrated bottom line, which is I can show you how behaving more responsibly to people and planet enhances every aspect of shareholder value. So if you're talking to a corporate, talk in that language. If you're talking to somebody in spirituality, you can, you can talk about that. And it's interesting, an increasing number of senior corporate leaders, essentially all older white men, are now getting interested in what is their legacy and interested in what's going to happen to them when they die, i.e. starting to get interested in spirituality. So there actually is a bit of an entree there. There is at the same time this huge growing movement of the B Corps. This is where young people want to work. There's a massive transference of wealth, pick your number, 30, 40, 60 trillion dollars from in general old white men to their kids, half of whom are women, essentially all of whom are millennials or younger. They don't want to invest it the way their dads did. This is why you're seeing BlackRock, State Street, JP Morgan, God save us, Jamie Dimon, all talking about we are a company with purpose. Yeah, bullshit. Their purpose is to make more money. But they, want, they are using this language because this is what their next demographic wants to hear. So Thanks. yes, there are answers. I think we will solve the climate crisis. It's going to continue to be a real hard slog, but uh, hell of a lot of great things happening. Thank you. Before we go back to John, could you, um, Hunter, I know I have that article someplace. Could you send me a reference to that article and I will send it to everybody? Uh, Tony's, I'll put it in the chat box. Uh, uh, okay, fine, great. John, you had your hand up a moment ago. Uh, I did. Um, I think all this is great, but I do not think that this will happen without a change in consciousness. Jan said the magic word toward the end of his talk, and that was complex. Well, I'm not sure that he really meant complex. I mean complex in the sense of not analytically tractable. We've spent five centuries learning how to solve problems, big problems, complicated problems by applying a lot of science and a lot of analytic power. But it doesn't work in big complicated systems, complex systems, sorry. 
right? I want to be careful here. Um, we need a really different way. These problems are going to continue to come. The solutions you're talking about are powerful, but they aren't addressing the, the I'd say the, the basic root causes here. And if we don't start behaving, be addressing them, you know, we'll make some progress, but they're going to arise. They're certainly going to arise as the rest of the world gets richer and begins to emulate our whole ethos of analytic based uh, quantitative way of, of seeing ourselves as human beings and uh, addressing it. Um, you know, I, I want to see a reference, read my book. I think it's a pretty good book, the last book I wrote, that encompasses a lot of this. And it's the result of going through a lot of the same kind of thinking that all you have. I appreciate it. I honor it. I respect it. But I don't think it's it's uh, going to get at these problems in the same way. I mean, we talk about geoengineering. Great, big, good, wonderful way to, to quickly try to buy time. We don't have a clue as to what the hell it's really going to do to this world. Um, I think we have to look at ourselves. I think Michael Pearson's much closer to it when he talks about humanistic business, humanistic, whatever it is. We're, 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 we're the ones. We better begin to understand a little bit, a little bit better. Uh, there's a lot of brain science. My work is now based on, on a lot of modern, recent cognitive research. It's helpful. It, it digs a level deeper and begins to be powerful uh, paradigm in explaining why we, we got here. It's, it's a, a very difficult because it's, you can't get there from where we've been. Uh, and you either buy it or not. I buy it and I find it really very, very helpful in moving off of some of this. Got to do what a lot of you say we have to do. But if we don't dig a lot deeper, my grandkids are just going to be faced with the same problem. Not me. That's it. Thank you. Nancy. You know, I appreciate these different perspectives. Um, and I, um, you know, I, I want to be enthusiastic and hopeful, but I also, um, I have read a lot of John's work and I, I, I don't think we're moving fast enough. I don't think we're going deep enough. You know, we do need to kind of change our culture from a very deep and fundamental way, which is not where most people, their, their brain activity is not there. It's, it's, it's in, I want to be happy. You know, I want to be on Facebook. I want to text my friend. So, you know, sort of like we're, we're rolling down this unbelievably fast roller coaster of, of looking for happiness that's very ephemeral and artificial and thin. Um, and we're not spending time going deeper and thinking about, you know, these more fundamental questions um, of humanity and what are we doing to this one planet that supports us. Um, so that, that's just one point. There's such a tension there between um, wanting to move the needle so much faster. I, I think the, um, what are the, the, uh, the society of the atomic society has the clock, you know, the doomsday clock and we're down to something like 100 seconds because now they're not just looking at nuclear, um, you know, they're looking at climate change. But, um, so there's that, but what I will say is I think one person, world leader who gets it right is Pope Francis. And I think he does speak to a lot of people. His prose are very accessible. You know, you read his stuff and you get inspired because he kind of hits us right between the eyes with 
what we're doing to each other and what we're doing to our planet. Um, but he also kind of just calls us to be more reflective and thoughtful. And I think um, we're, we're people, what I, I guess what I'm saying is we're people, the general populace may not be able to read stuff that Michael Pearson is writing and really connect to it because it's, it's you know, um, it's, it's very, um, you know, intellectual. And it just might not be something that people can pick up and read and really walk away and say, oh yeah, I, I get that. That really inspired me. I want to read more. I feel like people can read Laudato Si and, and be inspired by it and, and get something out of it. And maybe that helps them to read more and, and then ultimately go deeper into you know, things that, um, things that are out there. So I'm just, I'm kind of pushing for education as being, um, a really important lever for affecting change in culture. Um, and I'm pushing for maybe having more like, like what is happening at Bard where, uh, sustainability is baked into every, every course that students take. It should be that way across our universities, but Laudato Si should be, you know, um, a required reading as well. Um, and I'll just say one more thing. I worry that, um, I worry for our youth, for our students, and for, you know, for my own kids who are college age, that we put too much on their shoulders. Oh, you know, this generation, they really get it. They're the ones that are asking for um, this integrated triple bottom line. And they're the ones that are really going to move this forward. There's not enough time, I don't think, to put it on them and kind of wait for them to grow up and become, you know, um, it, it, part of our culture that is really moving things. And I feel like us older generation people need to listen to their voices and take action because we have the money, we have the connections, we have the experience, we've got the big networks. Um, it's really on us to support and, um, and advance what the young people are looking for and what the young people want. So I, I think it's a big challenge for baby boomers and you know, sort of for our generations to take this on and take it very seriously. Thank you. Hunter? A yeah, slight correction. I did not say it is the responsibility of the younger generation. It is not. Greta is quite right in saying we need the adults and we need the adults to act. She says uh, the adults say, oh, you're giving hope. She said, I don't want your hope. I want you to act. I want you to act as if the house were on fire because that's what it is. Some of us do not take weekends. Some of us do not take vacations. I do this work pretty much 24 seven because this is the time. We are gonna get this one solved now or it's over. We really are getting very close. Had Mr. Trump won again, I probably would have quit. I probably would have just become, well, gone back to, well, I'm living on my ranch. Just quit teaching, quit flying airplanes, quit doing any of this shit and just be a Colorado cowgirl because at that point it would have been over. And now I think they're, the, the time is now to, uh, to go hard. I'll sleep when I'm dead. David? Well, Hunter, uh, you should celebrate the fact that uh, the population pyramids are getting steeper and steeper. You can live longer these days, this is good. So I don't think the baby boomers are going to be able to get out of the woods here very soon. They're going to be responsible for a while uh, yet. My concern, actually, if I try to synthesize a lot of what uh, has been uh, expressed, and I, I applaud it all, my concern is actually, I think it's kind of something that both Nancy and Michael were kind of hitting at. It's what is the role of the university? That's number one. And number two, particularly, what is the role of the business school in the university? I really think that what Michael is doing is helping to change, um, and probably Hunter, this is what you're also doing at, at Bard, is just changing the narrative, changing 
challenging, basically, uh, some fairly fundamental things. But ultimately, the business school has got to be responding to whatever it is, <laughs> is the responsibility of business in society. And um, I, I think it's astounding to me at how superficial the understanding of business is uh, among the general population and the, and the contribution that business can make or should be making or striving to make. So that's just, you know, I get on that soapbox every once in a while. Michael has heard this uh, before many times and uh, I applaud his work. Um, the, the thing I would mention um, is that in this uh, initiative that I have in the curriculum on innovation and business and energy, there's a framework that pervades everything that we do. It's called the star in the Pentagon. And it's looking at five categories of influences that I think have all been addressed in the comments today. Um, and one of them is uh, science and technology. And this is to sort of flag that there is the sort of incessant pressure to advance fundamental knowledge and applied knowledge, but I subscribe to the idea that yes, there is absolutely no silver bullet here. We, we have a toolkit of things that we can probably apply, but there's not one single thing that's gonna solve all of our problems. That actually interacts with another category that's called the resource endowment, which includes people, but it's much more than just people. It's also natural, natural resources. It's infrastructures once they're put into place. It's what is it can we, that we can exploit? And then uh, to advantage, uh, to make constructive change. The third category is the market system, which is really complex. And this is where business schools tend to just focus. It's the interaction between enterprise and markets. We have to understand what markets are. We have to understand what enterprise is all about. The fourth one is states. And we have to acknowledge that when Joe Biden gets elected, which I applaud, I'm happy, I'm celebrating, he can't do everything. And we shouldn't just expect that the, that the federal government in the United States is going to just wave a magic wand, even if they can get the two parties to agree and that everything is gonna be better. It's not, it's gonna take work. And we also have to recognize that the US system of government, the state decision-making is so different from France, from Germany, from China, from God only knows where, and somehow we have to pull all of this together. And then the fifth one, which is really complicated and is where I think everything kind of focuses is what are called institutions. And these are the things that are unstated. It's how we organize the world. Uh, it is, are the conventions that we subscribe to whether we even know it or not. Each one of these categories of influences have to be acknowledged if we're going to be changing anything. And I completely agree with Hunter. We have solutions right now. The question is, why the heck aren't we doing anything? Why, why are they not being accepted and implemented? And you just go around the SIP and you can begin to find answers as to why. Why aren't we thinking about transitional paths to some sort of ultimate optimum? You know, there are all kinds of things we can do right now to reduce the carbon uh, emissions in the atmosphere. Anyway, that's enough. That's, I'll, I'll stop there. Thank you. Jack, I don't see your hand raised, but um, I'm thinking of you. Go ahead. Okay. Um, yeah, I'm hearing a lot of things. And from just someone's perspective who is young and who is dealing with a lot of these things, I think a lot of us aren't focused on like what the what people are putting on us and i think a lot of people are just accepting the challenge i work with a lot of students at form university and no matter how big it is i think that they're just not concerned with like what like the baby boomer generation or all those have put on us because it's just we're pursuing something so great and a lot of people are excited about it so i think that that isn't my concern i think my main concern is a young person as a student is maintaining the optimism that we that we talk about in Professor Pearson's class, where we're trying to maintain that we can't, the, the systems are available to make the change. And the pessimism comes in versus just those in charge right now. 
So we're trying to just use the, to try to keep an optimistic outlook. And I'm less concerned with how you, how the world we've been given. And we're just trying to pursue change. I think a lot of young people are thinking that way from what I'm hearing with you guys. And the other big thing is just, we're, we've all actually got a pretty optimistic view uh, despite all this. Cause I think you kind of have to kind of what, uh, what Jan said earlier. Thank you. I saw Michael nodding his head very firmly when David was speaking a few moments ago. And yes, and I do have my blue hand up, so I'm not sure if you see it. No. But well, one more thing. <laughs> Responding to it. I've turned it to you, but let me interrupt for a moment. Can you also mention Sophia Towns, whom you were attracted to, Sophia Town, you attracted to Fordham, in the context of uh, John's concern about changing culture and, and mindfulness, I, I would say mindfulness. Go ahead, I'm sorry for interrupting you. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I resonate with a number of, of things that's, that are being said and I just wanted to share that and, and see how potentially we can also weave weave a web here uh, that, that is at the same time realistic and, and optimistic and empowering. I call it enlivening, enlightening and empowering, the three E's. And I think that's what education ultimately does. And I do think that the current framework of education is not gonna be, it, it's gonna be part of a solution possibly, but it's not gonna be enough. So we need to rethink many of the institutions that we have inherited. It's sort of, I think about it in terms of World War II, we created new institutions because we had a total breakdown. We are facing a total breakdown. We're not seeing it. We're not building the institutions yet that we might need to have. And I think the institution that we're underestimating is, humanity at large as a cultural sort of uh, conversation. And fusing and infusing these memes and the questions and the inquiries that I think are missing in, in the current culture that Nancy was sort of mentioning in terms of this flat happiness or the, or the uh, I don't know, material sort of drug addiction of sort, which is real in many ways, but is also sort of just, a, I think, a, a metaphor for how we live our lives. Um, I, I think there's much in the complexity, but there's also much simplicity that we're potentially missing. And when Jack and, and when we're talking in class, um, the bigger picture seems pretty obvious to pretty much everybody, I think. And, and many of the young people, but many of the older people, we're all suffering from the same kind of deficiencies, a lack of purpose, of higher purpose, and a lack of, of true alignment and community. And the market system has been the one that's overpowering us in a way that culturally, that it's really just making us atomistic players. And I don't know if you can hear me well enough, they're doing constructions in the background, but um, I think the biggest solution overall to me seems removing what we call intellectually pluralistic ignorance the idea that we think we are we are separate from others. We we are the only ones that are thinking that way. We're the only ones that uh, that are uh, suffering, et cetera, et cetera. And, and when you then bring people together, you actually hear much more about the shared common concerns, the common uh, the commonality, the the shared humanity that we're uh, not getting to when we're watching CNN, when we're watching whatever Facebook news, when we're watching all of that kind of garbage, that's really just sort of uh, pollution uh, in a cultural sense. And so if we can remove some of that, and uh, I'm just gonna throw in, I think John, the, the consciousness piece to me is the critical piece. That's the, where, where it all is, starts. And that's where these solutions will happen. And when that consciousness shift is occurring, in a way through conversations, cultural conversations, uh, then all of these solutions technical will put, be put in place. I, I do think that one of the reasons why we don't have them is because we're not opening up this black box of our cultural evolution or consciousness where we're stuck in a rut that uh, we say we're, we're individuals and we have to care about our, ourselves, and if we care about others and the species, we're just somehow tree huggers. We're somehow not, we're soft, we're soft. And all of that language, if it shifts, that we're actually fundamentally human if we connect on that, that we're much more human 
at that level, we give ourselves permission that way. And then I think this transition can happen quite quickly. So I'm trying to balance the complexity with the simplicity in a way that there is proven sort of evidence that people, humanity has survived until now when we collaborate. And, and a, a way to collaborate is language and language shapes culture. And if we can shift that culture more quickly, I think we have a way to, to remove pluralistic ignorance and, and get to the solutions. Jan. So in, in uh, my youth, when I didn't have gray hair, and by the way, the reason I'm here now is because of my grandchildren. That's why I, that's why I do this. Um, so I, I did elementary particle theory, which is about as far removed from the real world as you can imagine. And then I went to Wall Street where I was in the middle of business where you know, it was as practical as you can get. And uh, so I have a kind of a mixed, uh, a mixed uh, approach to this. I, I, I do resonate with a lot of what's being said here now. Um, I think that if we look carefully, as, as we all know, at, at, uh, at the situation, as we find ourselves right now in the real world with people as they are, then uh, we do, as Hunter says, have the solutions to right now on the shelf, off the shelf that we can largely solve the problem of climate change and at least avoid its worst impacts. New technologies are welcome uh, and they will come and they will be helpful, but we don't actually need them to. And we are doing a lot right now. A lot is happening. You know, the, the Midwest is full of two things. It's full of climate deniers and it's full of wind power, you know, because it's cheap. So, you know, so things are progressing. We just need to enhance our ambition. So that's, that's number one. Number two is, uh, is the denier. So we are talking about, you know, uh, having, uh, having communication with other people, but half of the population in the United States has been poisoned by climate denial. And uh, starting with Richard Lindzen and, uh, you know, progressing through Ray, Lee Raymond and uh, the 1990s with Exxon Mobil and, uh, you know, through the uh, through uh, Myron Ebel at the, you know, the Trump administration and so forth. So this is really bad. And so one of the things that I think is really important is to face climate denial head on through resources like Skeptical Science, John Cook's website, and uh, to, to really, uh, re really, really, really face this. And the third thing is to recognize that climate change, the problem of climate change is that there is a carbon budget. We all know this, a carbon budget just can't be exceeded in order to maintain a livable world. And the real question is who gets to spend, you know, the additional energy in order to, you know, and, and still stay within the carbon budgets. That is, there are questions of equity there. Uh, there are questions of, you know, 800, you know, uh, hundreds of millions of people don't have electricity at all. Uh, the United States uses, uh, you know, on per capita 10 times the energy of an average uh, uh, subcontinent person. And so there are all these questions in the end, humanity, the analogy that I use is in a leaky boat. There's a hole in it. If we don't bail the water out and fix the hole, we're all gonna sink. All countries actually recognize this. And so that's why the Paris Agreement was formed. It's not enough, but it's a start and we need to act together. At the same time, the future of the use of the carbon budget will involve even if the carbon, even if the NDCs of the Paris Agreement are maintained and, and upheld, uh, will involve uh, underdeveloped countries basically using up the carbon budget uh, in, in a quick manner. So what we have to do is I think in the United States, because we're all in the United States, is to do, uh, accept our responsibilities, do what we can with the federal government, which has now changed, and with all of the other assets that we have, we are still in at a local and state level with business and so forth to address the climate problem, spread the actual uh, urgency of the climate problem, which is, I think, the biggest survival and ethical problem that we have. Lautaro C is exactly right. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, this is not something that we can solve in a week, a day, or a month. It's, it's persistence is really essential. Optimism is essential and courage is essential because uh, these are difficult problems. 
and we need to and, and we need to address them address them head on. So uh, we're doing what we can. We just have to keep going in the world that we have now. Thank you. It's now exactly one hour, I believe. I know some of you have. I'm sure some of you have to leave, and so please leave. Um, and um, some of us might stick around for a while and keep going. But thank you very much for being here, and don't feel bad when you have to move on to the rest of pre-Thanksgiving events. Thank you, Jim. Thank you. I'm going to send out a message afterwards asking folks to um, give me give us one article that we should read, just an article, not a book, and I'll send that to everybody. I'll send out a message requesting that. And sometime or another, I'll talk about the project that Jack and, and James and I are involved in, which might be framed as a cultural focused project for, John, for John's concern and everybody's concern about changing our culture. Okay, anybody else want to comment now? Hold on a second. I just wanted to... Yep. Um... And uh, um, it's great. We need all these voices. Uh, you know, I I, uh, I sound uh, like uh, Hunter. I I have my own broken record. Um, uh, it has changed over the years. Uh, I have to say, I began strongly in the. Uh, same area as as Jan is talking, Hunter's talking. I'm a technology guy. I've, you know, I'm an MIT product, and um, but I really have come to to see that as as uh, uh, both a, a blessing and a curse. Uh, we're addicted to it in a, in a way, and and uh, that 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 though we we uh, it it. Um, so I uh, uh, often am, am, am held to uh, be much more of a, of a, of a critic. Uh, I'm not, it's critical. Um, but if we don't begin to look for solutions beyond solving the, the, the symptoms and get at the roots, um, this is bound to come up. Come on, we, we, we're... we're, we're 300 million, 370 million people in, in a 7 billion, 8 billion population of the world. What, what, what's gonna happen with all these other people? Um, we can't solve this problem. A lot of it is U US centric. Um, although I do, do understand that, that there, the, there is a, a, a recognition among this part, group today, eight folks, that it is not just a U.S. problem. We got to get at least back it in, into the climate, into the Paris Accord. But you know, technology is not the solution for the world. Um, anyway, this is great, um, and I do have to go. Michael, it's really good to see you. Uh, we never really got beyond a few emails, but uh, certainly I. I uh, uh, appreciate what you're doing. Um, I would love to connect more, John. Uh, oh, let's <laughs> use it. That'd be fine with me. Awesome. Awesome. Great. Yeah. Thank you so much. Okay. I've got to go. Jim, I, I really appreciate, Jim, I really appreciate this, uh, you know, chance. I thought it was a really interesting discussion and I really appreciate everybody that, uh, that spoke. John, uh, yeah, he's, he's gone. Okay. I was just going to say that one of the things that came out of MIT is En-ROADS, which I really like. Jim uh, Stoner can take credit for that too. <laughs> okay. Okay. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Thank you to meet you, Jan. Nice to meet you. Bye, Jim. Oh. Thank you. Happy Thanksgiving. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Jim, Jim, the Jim, the double Jims. Happy Thanksgiving, everybody. Thank you, James. Happy Thanksgiving. Great to see you, Michael. Nice to meet you, Jan. Bye, -bye. bye guys. Bye. Bye, bye, everybody.